Hello and welcome back to the workshop for an episode dedicated to the Manurin MR73 revolver. Yep, that's how you say it, Manurin. Um, so what is there to say about this wonderful revolver? Well, uh, it is a masterpiece of 70s engineering. It is superbly accurate. It is uh, bomb proof. It has a trigger mechanism second to none. It is exceedingly expensive and uh, oh yeah, hashtag GIGN. Thanks for watching. Bye. Oh, beer o'clock. Woohoo. Now, that wasn't really the entire episode, although it sums up most of the information out there on these revolvers. Uh, but that's not good enough for Bloke on the Range. We'd like to delve a little deeper. Now, uh, what I propose to do is to delve the deeper into the trigger mechanism because um, the reputation is entirely justified but there doesn't seem to be much information out there as to why it's so good. So I propose we uh, take the side plate off and have a little look. Now this is my uh, four inch sport model. Uh, it's dated from 1982, possibly early 1983. Uh, so it's a 100% Mulhouse produced uh, revolver, not a Chapuis one. Uh, you can easily tell the Chapuis produced ones, by the way, because they have an HA serial number. Whereas all the uh, prior ones have a single letter and the letter will correspond to the model. Uh, so this four inch sport model starts with a K, for example. Um, so yes, um, this will be only the second time I've ever taken the side plate off it in about seven years of owning it. Um, it's worked until then. I've cleaned the outside and the, the uh, cylinder cut out and the frame and the cylinders, but the mechanism has never needed any care whatsoever. So this will be a privilege and uh, let's delve right in. Now, before we start, I thought we might want to see the original box and what came with it. So here we are, Manufacture de Machine du Haut-Rhin, which is where Manurin comes from. Mulhouse Bortzwille, despite the name, is in France. Um, now, the actual founder was uh, a German, Jules Spengler, maybe Julius Spengler, in uh, 1919. He set up his business across the border, uh, originally making uh, machines for the food industry. And uh, it's actually only in 1922 that the, the first sort of orientation towards armament starts with uh, ammunition production. Anyway, so this is what the, the box that my gun came in. Here you have normally a series of Allen keys. One of them is secreted inside the grip here. Um, you'd have a little screwdriver, rudimentary cleaning kit, and in this case, a second cylinder, because this one came with a uh, nine millimeter cylinder, which is actually currently in the gun. But we'll speak about the difference between two cylinders later. Um, so the 9mm cylinder was an option and it is not numbered to the gun. So uh, there's no matching 38 and 9mm sets as it were. So let's see what other goodies we've got on the underside if I can remove it. And there we are. So we have a uh, Manual here in German, it's showing the range available, breakdown of the parts, how to clean it, disassembly, changing the barrel if necessary. So here it says, for example, is advertising the 9mm cylinder. Here we've got uh, an adjustment table, how many uh, millimeters at 25 meters. Uh, how many millimeter adjustment you get per click on the sights. Now these sights I have are the original uh, Swiss made sights. I don't know who made them in Switzerland. Uh, they underwent a couple of changes. I see that the modern ones now are, are different from what they these are now. Uh, there was an American site, Miller site I think originally and I think it's changed again uh, with the latest ones. So. Uh, don't quote me on that. So this is a target model. So as you can see, it's big, wide, blank there and a nice square front sight. 
with a slight inward angle there to get a nice shadow. Since we're here, a nice important point here is that this marking, so MR73 caliber 357 Magnum, was on the right side up until 1981, and then it came to the left side. So other stuff we have in here, we have actual manuals now. Here I've got French and German. With uh, more exploded diagrams. And here is my proof certificate. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a date on it. So, all sorts of goodies. Notice on the top here that it says Group Matra. This is because uh, Matra was uh, a significant partner starting from 1978 and then became actually a major, well, had controlling rights to Manurin from uh, 1983. So you may or may not see this logo depending on the age of your gun if you have lucky enough to have the manual with it. Okay, so here we go. Let's quickly remove the grips. Now these are original Trausch, Trausch grips. Uh, I believe, and that went out of business years ago, but I believe that the the mould or the patterns were passed on because the modern ones appear to have the same style of grips. Not quite. These are designed just to be removed with a coin of the realm. There we go. Also, it's an interesting little feature. You can nestle an Allen key in here. It's clamped in there so it won't ping off and interfere with the uh, with the mainspring uh, but that then allows you to adjust the trigger stop here and the uh, reset system which we'll see in a sec so there you go another interesting point here is that this side plate has three screws uh, the modern ones now have only two, so this one is gone and is replaced just by uh, a beveled surface between the two, between the frame and the uh, side plate. And that change is somewhere between 1984 and 1986. I'm not exactly sure when. Right, now for, to make things easier, I will also remove the cylinder, which is just by done by removing this screw here. That won't fit. Remove it since we need to remove it anyway. So it's just a little screw with an inner the blocking stud at the end. And there it comes off. No problem. Alright, then we'll take the other two off. Hope this isn't too shiny for you on screen, but unfortunately. The finish makes it very difficult to not make it shiny. And there we go, the big reveal. And you can see here, for example, how well finished this is. There are no machining marks left whatsoever. You just got a, a sort of satin black finish inside so let's bring that up close now some of you will immediately think this is basically a uh, Smith & Wesson action and you'd be right it's extremely similar to the uh, 1905 M&P action uh, with one important difference which we'll come to in a second but essentially uh, they've basically made things, parts, hard where they need to be, judicious use of materials, and there's an awful lot of space in here compared to the Smith & Wesson equivalent. And yet it is significantly more robust. 
Okay, so I've put the cylinder back in because otherwise it won't work, obviously. So let's see where this double action mystery comes in. So I'll take off the hand spring. Um, this is actually the second pattern. The first one was very rapidly replaced. It was a sort of um, safety pin wire spring, uh, but the hand was known to bounce in a particularly vigorous double action. So uh, they replaced it with this part rather quickly. And remove the hand as well. The hound, hand ground part, this. So, uh, so, in single action, there's nothing particularly amazing about it, as has been remarked before. Uh, but what is fascinating is the trigger reset. Now, instead of the Smith & Wesson, which just has uh, this sliding carriage with acting against a spring with a, a pin stop, this is actually a little slider on wheels. And if you can see that, so it has four wheels and it rides on a little rail machined in the frame here. And then there is a central abutment roller in the middle, which has its own little groove. Um, so it has that itself has no contact with the frame, just with this reset spring here, which on which you can adjust the tension down at the bottom there. And this is where the secret lies. Uh, this system was patented by um, a manual employee by the name of uh, Gilbert Maillard and um, patented in, well, filed in 1973, um, pretty much all over the world, France, UK, uh, Germany, uh, US. Now I can put the pattern numbers in the description if you're interested. And there is a very helpful force diagram which will show us exactly what's going on. Okay, let's get ready for some physics. So what we have here is exactly what's happening here. So we've got the uh, back end of the slide with the abutment roller and the reset spring. Now this is the at rest position with point of contact here and a force F0. Now this force is the one necessary to reset the trigger and also ensure that the trigger has rebounded into its safe position. So you've got a safety lockout here and the normal one at the top there as usual. Now what happens with a Smith & Wesson system which has the coil spring acting on a peg is that as you move the trigger back you're compressing the spring and you get an increase in perceived force on the trigger as you near the end of travel before trigger release. In this case what's happening is that as the carriage moves back the point of contact moves up along the roller so you have a normal force F here if you split that into its uh, horizontal component and vertical component here, F1, F2, F2 is basically soaked up by the, uh, the little rollers here that are acting down and the frame, which means the only bit perceived by the user is F2. And using clever geometry and uh, spring properties, what they've done is that as the transition takes place here, F2, sorry, F1 here, essentially stays the same. So there's no increase in force uh, wherever the, the trigger is. So between its reset position and release, there's really no difference in uh, spring pressure on the trigger. Now this is really, really clever. And what amazes me is that since this was patented in uh, 1973, uh, it's long dead and no one's taken advantage of it. And I really wonder why. So there we go, that was the big reveal about the lockwork. Uh, let's not forget that 
as well as the adjustment of this uh, clever trigger return spring, we can also adjust the mainspring, which means you can find that sweet spot that's just right for your particular trigger preference. So what I suggest we do next is take a closer look at the 9mm cylinder because that is special in its own right. And then we'll uh, finally head to the range where I propose I simply do a little uh, demonstration of the difference in performance between shooting 9mm and in this case shooting 38 Special. So here we have uh, the uh, 38 Special 357 Magnum cylinder at the top and the 9mm at the bottom. And to swap them around you simply remove the crane and cylinder assembly, pop one off literally and uh, put the other one on. You see how well tolerance that is? Anyway, uh, what they've also done, which is very thoughtful of them, is that they milled a little recess here in the rear circumference of the cylinder, so it gives you a little tactile and visual uh, indication of what cylinder is in the revolver, should you for some reason not be able to pop it out. Um, fat not a good it does me, uh, I'd be lying if I told you I haven't been to the range once or twice with the wrong ammo in the bag. So, uh, how does this one work? Uh, it is a proprietary system once again invented by uh, Gilbert Maillard. And we can see a little bit of uh, what's going on here. I put the pattern drawing in just to see, perhaps you can get a bigger, clearer view. But what we have is that each chamber, uh, each corresponding slot in the ejection star, has an independent wire spring here with a little bulge on each side. So that's going to retain the extractor groove of the 9mm one. So they go in quite freely, but you do have to just push them in at the end. And um, what is critical is that these little bulges here are not exactly diametrically opposite one another. So that means they grip the rim just under halfway, sort of about here, let's say. And the consequence of that is that when you eject, they pop out freely. So if you can get a relatively quick reload, the only thing you have to bear in mind is you do need to just push them home. So in contrast to the, the uh, 357 or the 38, which just slide in, of course, as a, as a rimmed cartridges. Now, something to bear in mind is that these um, 9mm cylinders are about. You can find them independently of the revolvers. However, um, there was a change in the uh, barrel dimensions. So from well up to and including uh, serial number 39,200, the bore diameter is actually 3, uh, 0.353, which is of course perfect for using 9mm. Uh, but above that serial number, uh, it went to 0.356, so the performance with 9mm will probably not be as good uh, as with the older generation, such as this one.
Zähl sie eins. Was? <lacht> das ist ein bisschen kleiner, gell? Hä? Das ist ein bisschen kleiner. Zähl. Hast du das dran? Ja. 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 So, I don't know why I found it so hard to uh, focus at 25, but there we are. Uh, it is what it is. We don't hide anything. Um, now, what I did was that I shot, I set the sights uh, with 38 Special at each distance, but I didn't touch them when I changed the cylinder. So, um, that accounts for a little bit of a grouping difference, particularly at 25. Uh, but you can see clearly that it shone at uh, 50 meters with the 38 Special compared to the 9 millimeter. And, of course, it proves that whatever you can do with six inches, you can do just fine with four. So I'm going to use one of the expressions that I absolutely hate, but justifies in this case. It shoots better than I do, which is true. Uh, absolutely nothing wrong in the gun. I can use it with full confidence, and all the errors on target are entirely mine. So, um, in terms of arms manufacturing, uh, Manuelin didn't stop there. Uh, after that, uh, there was the uh, MR. 93 and the MR96, both of which I would, I'm actively seeking to add to my collection because they have a couple of uh, mechanical uh, aspects which are very interesting. Um, and of course, prior to the MR73, there was the licensing deal with Walter to produce the uh, PP, PPK and P38. But Manuelin did not only um, manufacture firearms. In fact, as I, if you remember right at the beginning, I mentioned that they started in the industrial food processing machinery, uh, but then they evolved uh, into a multitude of other side businesses, uh, including precision measuring instruments. And the one I found the most interesting is they also produced mopeds, this beautiful piece of engineering. Uh, actually, it was a licensed product uh, from a Bavarian company, DKW, they had manufacturing rights in France, and actually in the end, DKW uh, transferred all the rights to Manuel. Uh, so they produced that for a while. Um, all these side businesses actually uh, disappeared in the uh, 70s, 80s when the, the recession happened. This was under Matra control, and they basically shut down everything apart from the arms uh, manufacturing and the ammunition manufacturing. And when uh, Chapuis took over the arms side, uh, the ammunition side continued. And that went through different owners. Uh, I didn't really look up too much. That seemed to switch even more uh, than the arms business. And of course, now we're lucky enough that Beretta has taken over from Chapuis to distribute this wonderful revolver everywhere. So um, here endeth the episode. I hope it wasn't too fanboy for you all. And I'll see you next time.